everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. You're listening to episode 34 of Postmodern Realities, and I'm Melanie Cogdell, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. On this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Richard J. Poupard, who is a medical doctor and a board-certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon practicing in Michigan. He also has an earned MA in Christian Apologetics from Biola University and is a speaker for the Life Training Institute. In the 2017 Volume 40, Number 2 issue of the Christian Research Journal, Rich has written a feature article called The Ethics of Modern Board and Card Games. Rich, it's good to have you on. Oh, it's great to be here, Melanie. Well, I'm really looking forward to this episode because I'm a major board game fan, and the modern board game ho- hobby has quite uh, a resurgence, I think, in the last few years. Um, I think when most people think about board games, you probably think of mass market games that they play growing up, like Monopoly or Scrabble, Uno, Clue, Battleship, or classic games like chess or backgammon. But today, more than a thousand board and card games in every imaginable theme and mechanic are released every year. And that's probably due to the influence of Kickstarter, really, for where smaller game uh, companies can and can um, have games up there. Uh, the hobby has also spawned a lot of huge conventions like Gen Con in Indianapolis, which was started in the 1960s, but last year had an attendance of more than 200,000. So that's quite a few people. Um, but how do board games relate to apologetics? Um, about 30 years ago, I think Christians were concerned with new emerging board games like Dungeons and Dragons and a collectible card game called Magic the Gathering. And they wondered if they're occultic due to their themes and if those were appropriate for Christians to play. We got questions about those. And so we wrote about those games back in the 80s and early 90s. But we thought we needed an update on how to discern which board and card games were appropriate for Christians to play like 25 years later. So we tapped Rich to write about it since he's a board gamer and he has more than 100 games in his collection and he even has a profile on Board Game Geek. So Rich, how have board games evolved over the past 20 to 30 years? Well, thanks, Melanie. There's been a significant evolution of board games in two really significant ways. Um, First of all, comparing the board games of today to the ones that you mentioned that that most people are familiar with, Um, a game of Monopoly, for instance. Um, The the experience of board gaming today has evolved in a way that makes it much more interactive and much more interesting. Um, For example, uh, most of those games don't involve much interaction between opponents, or opponent can be knocked out early in the game say for like Monopoly. The games of today are somewhat, they're, they're finite in the amount of length of time it takes, although there's a lot of variation with that. Um, they involve a lot of different player interactions, so when it's not your turn, you don't just need to play off into space. A lot of the gameplay has a lot of um, actually um, dealing with what your opponents are doing, and most importantly, um, they involve making very interesting decisions. Instead of just rolling the dice or guessing where the battleship is, um, you've got, there's a lot of uh, interesting decision, both in a mechanical sense or strategic sense, but sometimes even in these games in a moral sense, which has been very interesting. Um, and the other part of the evolution, you mentioned Kickstarter, but ironically, the electronic media has actually really pushed the envelope in popularity of, of, of modern board gaming. Um, now you have podcasts like the Dice Tower. You have a YouTube channel, Tabletop, in which celebrities play board game. And you mentioned Board Game Geek, the, um, the the website in which you can actually get any question answered about the games, look at different reviews, both written and video reviews, um, as well as a number of times I've asked the rules question, and the designer of the game goes on there and, a- and, and answers them. And all of these things have really helped to increase the popularity of the game. When I was first involved in the hobby maybe 15 years ago, there's only a couple specialty online stores that you could actually order these games from. Now, your local bookstores and most, uh, we have a, a, a number of gaming stores in our area, and it's really just exploded in popularity. I know, I was driving in my town, and I saw this store, it said, Your Local Game Store, and I thought, that was the name of the store, and I thought it was a video game store, and come to find out it was a board game store, and in fact, um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the games that you mentioned in the article a little bit later, but I was trying to think, well, where could we take photos of these games, because I didn't own them, and they have actual different, you know, tournaments weekly, so we sent... Uh, the graphic designer and a photographer down there, and they just interacted with all the people there and took all kinds of photos. So there's a lot of local game stores and board game cafes now. Um, Why do you think that participating in board and card games 
is maybe more advantageous over mobile gaming or, you know, video gaming, like what we think of like Xbox gaming or those kinds of things where people are gaming electronically versus, you know, board games? Yeah, each of us, I have teenagers in my own home, and and uh, we've seen the frustration of just seeing all these kids staring blankly in their screens um, with, without a whole lot of, of human interaction, or going to someone when they're playing on their computer or playing an Xbox where they're just not really interacting. And the number one advantage of, of, of the of modern boarded card games is human interaction. It is a social event in which you can ex- have an experience together. You can uh, basically scratch the itch of, of, of thinking together and working um, solving these problems and, and, and competing against one another in a face-to-face manner where you can actually, um, you know, interact in, in, in that way with others. A lot of the games nowadays, a, a new genre which has come out in the last decade, are cooperative games where as opposed to even um, having one person win, the whole group either wins or loses as a group as you can do these things together. And that really, I think, in many ways, is, is a real advantage uh, as opposed to even if you're, you're playing a, a mobile game or a computer game against someone, some unknown person across the world. Um, it, it just, it's nice to be able to kind of return to the human interaction element of things. Well, I know some, in general some Christians might be um, against playing any kind of game, whether it's a board game or a card game or a video game. Um, are there any negative consequences from taking any kind of hardline stance on playing games in general? Yeah, well, I, I do think that each one of us has to listen to the Holy Spirit, and we may have personal convictions about either the way that we spend our time in entertainment or um, the theme, the thematic elements that we uh, will allow ourselves to take place in. And I never want to step on those for those who have that personal conviction. Um, but I, I come from a, 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 a faith tradition that is very... Uh, strict as to allowing fantasy elements and um, or, or other elements of, of, of card gaming um, that I think has shown negative consequences. I tell the story because I think it just illustrates it very well. I used to be involved in a, in a group that played a, a game called Euchre, which is um, we, we play here in the Midwest, um, a non-gambling game that uses regular cards. And we used to all get together. A number of the people in my church got together. We used to invite people in the neighborhood, and it was just a fantastic outreach. And, and then one week, somebody came in and said that, well, they, they didn't want to, they couldn't participate anymore because they had signed up to be a teacher at a local Christian school and signed a, um, a, a contract that stated that they wouldn't in, be involved in, in, in card games. Um, and soon thereafter, the whole group sort of just disbanded because uh, we all felt like we were really doing something, you know, that didn't seem right uh, it, by possibly causing our Christian brother to stumble. And I think that's a, that, that was certainly a negative consequence. This, this activity, which we were all involved with, that was a fulfilling activity, that we were able to uh, have good fellowship and outreach to other people in our neighborhoods to get to know us better, um, got shut down because of uh, what I would detail now, an irrational fear of being involved in, in bad things. So as we evaluate games, and there's you know, so many things, so many different types of genres of games to evaluate now, I always keep that in my mind, is this certainly I don't want to open myself up or my children up to things that are, that are, that are wrong and evil. But at the same time, um, am I also closing myself down to possibly in creating relationships with other people um, by a, a, a too hard of a stance? Um, and that's been kind of helping to guide my principles since that time. I know that there's some games out for you know a long time, but some of the more modern board games that involve, for example, bluffing. So like the board game that I've, I've seen at a Target and Walmart is Sheriff of Nottingham, and it involves, I mean, the whole thing is bluffing. And so as a parent, should you allow your child to play uh, a game like that involves bluffing, which is basically lying about the cards you have or the, the items that you have. So should Christians avoid any actions in games like bluffing that would be unethical in real life? And what are some of the guiding principles to help us decide, okay, is it okay to introduce our child to a bluffing game or, you know, those kinds of things? 
Yeah, this this is very tricky too, Melanie, because obviously we don't want to introduce things, sinful things to our kids and think that it's okay. If we say it's okay in a game, is it now okay in real life? I, I really don't want my kids bluffing as to what they have in their in their backpack every morning um, as, they, as they do in the, the game Sheriff of Nottingham. Um, but I think some guidelines when we think about it, there's a, we have to understand, and we do understand in many ways, that there is a difference between having our kids use their imagination to do things and having them uh, be involved in what's going on in, in, in the real world. Uh, for example, you know, many kids dress up as pirates for, uh, for Halloween and, and, and pretend to play pirates. Now, obviously, the idea of a pirate is horrific. If our kid really was out there um, pretending to be a thief or pretending to be uh, uh, to, to, to pillage different villages, that, that was not a life that was that was very Christ-like. Um, but as far as putting on a, a pirate costume, most parents don't really seem to have too much of a problem with that. And I think one of the reasons is the amount of of space we have between the action itself and and what we are. Um, well, we're, the things we are performing in a board game. So if we are pretending to be a spy, for instance, and playing a game called The Resistance, um, we are simply doing make-believe, and that's different than, I think, telling lies in real life. Um, in terms of Sheriff of Nottingham, and I, ha- I have played that, played that game, I don't think we're necessarily um, uh, condoning or, or, or trying to say that lying is a good thing. Uh, we are simply in a very safe, fun imaginative environment expressing that part of of our creativity um, and I personally I don't think that is necessarily problematic but there of course there's you know there there are there are different types of areas in which I think it would be for instance if we were acting out a truly evil act just on top of my head if we were planning out a a, a bank robbery or planning out murdering someone and that was the object of the game um, I think that would be too close to an action that would be performed in real life, and I would certainly have a, a significant moral problem with it. So why does a genre of a game make any difference in determining its appropriateness? Now, for example, there's a lot of people who play those you know, old war games. I mean, there's still a lot of war games out there. They're reenacting some battle from you know, the 19th century, or they're reenacting the Civil War battle, and that involves troops and killing and so forth. Would that be different than other genres that you mentioned, fantasy genres? I know sometimes when you see various different factions, that might be like, I don't know, the witches or the sorcerers or something like that, that is, um, Christians would find have an occultic element. Would that be wrong for certain Christians to play that? So how do we know, you know, what would be appropriate? Now, I do think, for example, you know, Christians would read a book like Lord of the Rings and they have some fantasy um, characters in them, like the orcs and different things like that. But outside of the, something that particular universe, is it wrong for a Christian to play those kind of fantasy games with those factions in them? Yeah, a very, diff- very difficult question to, to answer necessarily. But it's, a, it's one of the guiding principles that I use in terms of using is what, what is the, jo- the genre of the game. Um, when you look at games itself, there is a you can go on one end of the spectrum as almost um, uh, games with, with really no theme at all or just kind of a theme that really doesn't matter, very abstract games. Example of that, for instance, Checkers would be a, a backgammon would be an abstract game. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have role-playing games, in which the, the whole nature of the game is to take on the role of another person and pretend to be the person and pretend to do the action of that person. And in between, you have a lot of, of, of variation between those two. Now, in part of the, evaluate, the evaluation of whether I think a, a, board, a game is appropriate is where it fits on that, that genre, uh, on, that, on that spectrum. In terms of abstract games, you look at a game like chess. Now, clearly, chess has its backgrounds in war, um, and uh, you know the idea of sacrificing a not important piece for a more important piece um, should have ethical considerations. But we don't ever really think of that when we play chess. It's simply using that that kind of thematic element 
as a strategy game. When you look at the movement of a pawn and the fact that the pawn can get itself easier, we don't see that as a less valuable human being. We just see that as a, 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 a mechanism in a, in a strategy game. On the other hand, I think, so in terms of if you have a game that's more abstract, and a war game would be another example, I think, um, I, I think it's not the fact that you are, you are playing a part that actually may be considered, um, if you're playing the Germans, for instance, in a World War II game, that you're not, you know, uh, condoning the, the the atrocities that the Nazis performed, um, nor are you, you know, putting yourself in that spot. There's enough uh, separation that it's simply you're looking at the strategy of war that was used and looking to solve the problem in the game in that way. On the other hand, I think it's more concerning when you're talking about things that are very, very thematic, where you're pl- actually uh, playing and acting out these types of things. I would be very uncomfortable, for instance, having to uh, say some kind of occultic incantation in order to cast some magic spell, actually being and behaving like the character itself or doing something evil in that in in that way. So, you know, it's an genre is an important determination in terms of um, how separated you are from the theme itself. So one of the things that led to the explosion of modern board gaming was um, European games coming to this country in the 90s. And so there's, you know, European style games and American style games now. Can you contrast the difference between American style games and so-called what they call for short Euro games? Yeah, especially in terms of genre, this is a, and sometimes an important consideration. Games that came out of Europe in the late 90s, for an example, and probably the, the, um, one of the first ones of importance was The Settlers of Catan by Klaus Teuber, um, that there, there is a theme involved, but if you look at a game that, was, that had come out of Europe, that, that type of game, it's mostly mechanically related. In other words, it's the mechanics of the game and trying to find solutions to the problems that the game gives you um, that is the driving force of the game. And oftentimes those that are in the hobby talk about even having pasted on themes. Essentially the designer designs this neat mechanic and then finds some kind of theme that they just paste on. Um, now, on the just closer to the role playing end, American style games are more thematic um, in general, and those are games in which you are more uh, involved in the uh, in the scenario itself. Um, it doesn't mean they're necessarily bad, but um, an example, a modern example, um, we've talked about is, is a game, recent game called Dead of Winter, um, in which places you in a scenario in which you are in a uh, apocalyptic type of scenario and you're trying to survive. Um, there, the mechanics of the game are not as important as the uh, the experience of the theme um, in that in that environment, and. You know, nowadays especially with the number of games coming out, there's a real mixing of these of these two blends. Um, but at the same time, the uh, it can help to see whether what's most important as you evaluate this game is it the mechanics. Is there just a theme that's put on there in order to try to make it interesting, or is it truly trying to experience the the theme itself? Um, and I think you need to be a little bit more careful the closer you are to putting yourself in and in, in, in experiencing a game in that way. You mentioned Dead of Winter, which involves zombies and, you know, people, survivors, and should, you know, you have people out of the camp and so forth. So when considering the environment of the game, that's like feels very stressful. You're in a post-apocalyptic environment and zombies are coming for you. What's the moral difference between those based in reality and then those made with human imagination? Like, I know I'm just, you know, imagining that I'm in this post-apocalyptic thing, or can it feel so real that there, there would be a question as to whether you should play it? Yeah, once again, I think that um, games that are designed in someone's mind than using an imaginary world, I think we should be we don't have to be quite as careful as as those that are actually involved in the real world of today. Um, in terms of Dead of Winter, yes, this is a a, a, a difficult scenario that you're. It's a co- cooperative game, semi-cooperative game actually, in which you're placed in a really tough scenario and you find solutions with your teammates. Um, in order to survive and make your way out. And at the same time, there's also another condition in which you're trying to win by yourself. It's 
a very interesting moral dilemma in terms of do I help the whole group and have us all win, or do I try to help myself and possibly have the whole whole group lose? It was, a, a, to be honest with you, a very uh, a fascinating gaming experience. Um, but because it, it is certainly you know not realistic and not in real life, I think that the uh, placing ourselves in that in that in, in a dangerous situation in a game in an otherwise safe environment, I think is 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 reasonable, and I don't think I didn't really have a moral problem with that. Um, at the same time, when we place ourselves in more realistic games, for instance, uh, having to collect different um, different. Uh, Types of ingredients to create spells in, in 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 a game about Wicca, or you know, once again, actually determining ways in which we can do an evil act or advancing evil in the real world. Um, I, I think that would be far more, in my opinion, morally problematic. What about games that have um, themes that you know Christians even study in school, like Egyptian gods or something? So I can think of um, some of those like, I don't know if it's a war game, like Kemet that has this big Egyptian and there's various different gods and you're doing these things. Is the game just something like, oh, I'm learning more about Egyptology or because it involves real Egyptian gods, we should avoid it? Well, you say real Egyptian gods, you mean, you know, gods of mythology. Yes, uh uh-huh. We we, we know we're not exactly real. You know, once again... Well, in their society, that they worship them, in other words. Yeah, the mythology of it, Mm -hmm. or or Roman mythology, whatever. Yeah, I I will tell you, I generally stay away from games in which, for instance, you have to do some kind of game mechanic in which you you have to worship some some make-believe god. Um, and others don't feel quite as as as, as worried, but that to me that's, that's 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 crossing a bit of a line. But once again, most of these times you are simply you know doing most of those games that I'm I'm thinking of. Um, there is a, a a game mechanic, and it's pretty much mostly uh, a mechanically based strategy um, that has this Egyptian theme kind of thrown in. And I don't think that in and of itself is a reason to, to necessarily avoid a game. But like I said, I, I am uncomfortable with the idea, for instance, of, um, of uh, you know, giving some sacrifice to some make-believe god um, or having to worship them even in a, in a gaming environment like that. Also, I want to address the um, issue of images in modern games. I think that would uh, be true for board games as well as video games. You see a lot of, like really crazy, demonic-looking kind of images. Then again, as I said, you know, if you watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the, those orcs can look kind of scary. Should we stay away from games that have kind of more of those scarier depictions of fantasy characters in games? Well, I think this is another, certainly another area for, for personal conviction. Um, we all have a, a, a different level that we are able to tolerate in terms of, of, of scary, uh, scary images. You know, obviously, the, if often a point of the game is to overcome evil and overcome adversity, having a scary guy that's that's, that's providing the uh, the opponent is is not an unreasonable thing. Um, but we all have different. Uh, another concern of mine is, you know, with a lot of the the, the modern things comes with some of our our. our our modern ideals too, and I do think that even in a board gaming environment, we need to um, value human beings as intrinsically valuable. And simply because we're doing some kind of fantasy, that we should not treat them in a uh, uh, it, it, treat even images of humans in in a, in a wrong way. So when you have a, a an extraordinarily, for instance, obviously overly sexualized woman in a gaming environment, I certainly think that that's certainly something to be avoided. Um, there, is a, a, there, there is a board game that I'm thinking of that actually the, the, uh, the, 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 the board itself is a stretched, supposed to be uh, an image of stretched out human skin. Well, I, I certainly would avoid that. So I do think we have to be cognizant and careful of the images that we have, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's hard to draw that line, but using some of these principles I think can be helpful. The last thing I want to talk to you about is, um, in particular, the collectible card game Magic the Gathering, because that we wrote an article back um, in the mid-90s about it, and there were a lot of concerns about its theme that was occultic. Is this a bad game for or um, Christians to play? Yeah, well, cause this, is, this is an example of the game I used in the article, especially, that, that kind of helped to evolve my uh, my my 
principles and recommendations in terms of gaming itself. Um, Magic the Gathering, if you don't know, is a, is a, called a collectible card game, and that means that you, uh, you collect a set of cards, you make a deck of cards, and you then play against another, component, uh, another opponent. We talked about the local game store. Many local game stores actually are in existence because of, of Magic. It is extremely popular. And as a, as a, a dad growing up, and one certainly concerned about Christian apologetics in terms of, of uh, and, and a gamer, um, you go to the website of Magic and you look, and there's a lot of things that I think we, that, 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 that concerned me. Um, the game itself, you're basically playing some kind of a wizard. You are using uh, a source called mana in order to cast spells um, and to, in, to, to, to create creatures that do the fighting for you. And then you fight against your opponent, and um, there, there's a winner and a loser. And because of the thematic elements, because of the whole using magic that's in the name of the game, you know, I was very concerned. Um, However, my, my son came to me, and uh, uh, there's a magic game in school, in their middle school, a magic club. And at our local game store, they have magic tournaments almost seven days a week now, at least four or five days. And his friends were becoming involved with it, and he kept on asking, well, you know, why? We should, you know, why is everybody else doing this? And, and it doesn't seem to be that problematic to them. So I did the best thing that I could do is I actually decided, well, you know, I, let me try this myself. And I was frankly very surprised after actually playing Magic and playing with my, my eldest son at that time just to see what it was like. You know, I expected this really fantasy element to be a, a big part of the game, and it turns out it wasn't. That it was uh, almost like playing a uh, uh, advanced version of chess. Um, there was a lot of strategy involved, both before to, to, to make your deck and to play against someone. We went to, went to a couple of the, the Friday Night Magic tournaments. And you, when you were playing the game, you didn't experience this idea of casting spells or using magic at all. It was more of a mathematics contest. You're trying to find the right combinations of cards, um, using uh, understanding the difference between probability of drawing a card and it, was, it was actually was a, was a very, very positive experience, as it turned out. So I actually did more investigation and looked into it, and the designer of the game, Richard Garfield, um, actually designed it as he's, he's got a Ph.D. in combinatorial mathematics. He designed the game as almost like a complex mathematical problem. And after he designed it, it was only then that they stuck some kind of you know, fantasy element on it that um, in order to give it some kind of flavor, because um, it would get kind of boring just putting down cards that really didn't have that. So um, in looking at evaluating whether or not it was right for us to play, I'm glad I got involved with Magic the Gathering. And I, I really um, kind of at least had to rethink how to approach games like this. Uh, we spent hours with my sons and, and, and other people um, I think not doing something morally objectionable, um, but at the same time something that I felt that just looking on the outside and the, the surface was going to be problematic. So yeah, and these are things, once again, I do think that, that you know, personal conviction is very important, and it's, it's difficult to, to uh, discern exactly where you wish to draw the line. But in this case, I, I never felt like I was being involved with anything that was in the least bit um, problematic in playing that game. Well, finally, I want to end with some fun rapid-fire questions for Rich. Rich, what do you like on your pizza? Oh, just pepperoni. And I'm boring. <laughs> given today's topic, what's your favorite board game to play and why? Um, right now, probably... Uh, Pandemic, um, especially the Pandemic Legacy version. We talked about that even before the podcast began. Um, one of the, the, the more fun board game experiences that I've had in the last five years. It was fantastic. And what was your very first job? Uh, I sold shirts in a mall. And it's March 2017. What's the most exciting thing that's happened to you this month? Uh, this month? Um, b besides this podcast? Um, Actually, it hasn't happened yet, but we're taking, taking the kids to, to Disney World in a, in a week or so. So um, I think as our family, that's probably the most exciting thing that's going to happen. That sounds exciting. Well, thanks, Rich, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks so much, Melanie. I very much appreciate it. 
Today's guest, Richard J. Poupard, has written a feature article for the 2017 Volume 40, Number 2 issue of the Christian Research Journal. It's called The Ethics of Modern Board and Card Games. To read his article, please subscribe to the journal. A six-issue subscription is $39.50, and to subscribe online, visit equip.org. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media. Like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities podcast on iTunes, and please share this episode on your social media accounts. Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure you go to equip.org where you can download our free smartphone app on which you can listen to the Bible Answer Man broadcast live, listen to previous broadcasts, make a donation, and subscribe to the Christian Research Journal. So until our next author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast.